Right then and there, a surefire campaign of persecution began in the papers, directed against the patriarch and high church authorities who were strangling the Volga region with the bony hand of famine. And the more the patriarch clung to his position, the weaker it became. In March, a movement to relinquish the valuables, to come to an agreement with the government, began even among the clergy. Their still undispelled qualms were expressed to Kalinin by Bishop Antonin Granovsky, a member of the Central Committee of Pomgol. The believers fear that the church valuables may be used for other purposes, more limited and alien to their hearts. Knowing the general principles of our progressive doctrine, the experienced reader will agree that this was indeed very probable. After all, the common turns needs of those of the East in the course of being liberated were no less acute than those of the Volga. The Petrograd metropolitan Venyamin was similarly impelled by a mood of trust. This belongs to God, and we will give all of it by ourselves. But forced requisitions were wrong. Let the sacrifice be of our own free will. So the church is saying, all right, if you're commanding us to lay down all of our property and, and sell things and give to the poor, um, this is actually in the Bible, even though, you know, the, the uh, government is making a mockery of it, but we will do it ourselves. This is a classic, um, you know, personal humanized idea of charity that part of the essence of it is for the individual, for one individual to give to another in the name of God. And so this is what the church says. Um, he too wanted verification by the clergy and the believers to watch over the church valuables up to the very moment when they were transformed into bread for the starving. And in all this, he was tormented lest he violate the censuring will of the patriarch. In Petrograd, things seemed to be working out peacefully. The atmosphere at the session of the Petrograd Pomgol on March 5th, 1922 was even joyful, according to the testimony of an eyewitness. Benjamin announced, the Orthodox Church is prepared to give everything to help the starving. It saw sacrilege only in forced requisition. But in that case, requisition was unnecessary. Kanachikov, chairman of the Petrograd Pomgol, gave his assurances that this would produce a favorable attitude toward the church on the part of of the Soviet government. And then Solzhenitsyn says in parenthesis, not very likely that. So this is one of the arguments against capitulating to the world in the church, right? Is that it always, you always try to gain curry favor with Caesar. Um, and it always turns out to be a fool's bargain. And, and Solzhenitsyn says easy in retrospect to judge them for this, even though of course it makes sense. Um, and so here's what happens. Again, things were getting fouled up. This is from the point of view of the party. Things were getting fouled up with some kind of compromise. The noxious fumes of Christianity were poisoning the revolutionary will. That kind of unity and that way of handing over the valuables were not what the starving people of the Volga needed. The spineless membership of the Petrograd Pomgol was changed. The newspapers began to howl about the evil pastors and princes of the church, and the representatives of the church were told, we don't need your donations, and there won't be any negotiations with you. Everything belongs to the government, and the government will take whatever it considers necessary. This is the attitude from the beginning toward Christian charity in the Soviet Union, because, of course, ch Christian charity undoes the entire logic of socialism, that promise that the government is going to take people's land and bread away and give it to you in a more equal way, right? The only answer to that is that, yes, there are inequalities in society, but virtuous giving can only happen at the level of individual choice. We individuals must choose to give up our possessions. That's what the church wanted to do in Volga, and that was what the socialist government could not abide. 